uh, eventually, but hello. Uh, I'm John Paul. If you have your computers out, that's great, because if you would like to, I just tweeted these slides, and they are actually um, interactive. So, as we go through this, if you'd like to play along, the browser actually has inside of it a code runner, which is minutes, if you want to take a look at the slides that I just tweeted. So I'm going to start off talking to you about ES6, uh, the new next version of JavaScript that has now gratefully significantly implemented in browsers, although there are some pieces that are um, still making their way into JavaScript engines right now. It took a very, very long time to get here. I don't know how many of you were necessarily developing JavaScript in the previous five earlier days, but the gap between ES6 and the version before was many, many more years. And it's taken a very long time for us to get to the stage where we can not only standardize the specification, but also get comfortable with actually using these pieces in a browser. I'd like to talk to you about that for a today. So what is ECMAScript? So ECMAScript is this weird name. It actually is the official name for the standard JavaScript, the standard JavaScript program. We can't use the word JavaScript because Java is trademarked by Oracle and we don't want to get sued by Oracle as a company in Frankfurt. ECMA International is a standard file. It is similar to IETF, the IEEE, all those other long lettered things that standardize exactly how many millimeters are between two different turns of a screw or exactly how a particular uh, programming languages should work. ECMA actually, how have you never seen these things before? They, they, they use that is all by like Cloud or something, but like these things used to exist, they were called floppy disks, and they're actually standardized officially by a international, uh, and not for by triple the other one. Similarly, the Dart programming language, the C sharp programming language, a few different programming languages are standardized by this ECMA international standard stuff, but only one is considered their official scripted language, a la ECMAScript, a la JavaScript. Our Beloved language while you are here for Connect Chance. So, by the way, since this is a fairly small group, and I don't think I've been recorded, feel free to raise your hand or yet yell out. I'm understandably my voice is much louder than everyone else's, but I will repeat if you have any questions as we, as we go along. So, ECMAScript uh, standardization is a snail snail snail. ECMAScript 3 came out in 1999, which was basically the first modern standardization of what Fred and I came into browsers. Uh, that added such great features such as dry cache and wait for it, regular thread. Before that, before 1999, in JScript and all the other implementations, there were not a lot of the common things we now assume are in every. I don't think I know of any version of this is not in every. It builds into the standard language. Anyway. Uh, and then, so 10 years later, further along this very snail pace of situation, we moved on to ECMAScript 5. So, ECMAScript 4 has a little bit of an uh, interesting history. Actually, script took a lot of that. ECMAScript 4 was never actually finished and standardized, or it was uh, ECMAScript 5 added such great things such as map filter, a lot of array operations that were announced. Uh, and it took a lot of that action. So how many of you use the prototype platform? Prototype JS? Right. Okay, so I actually started using prototype, and I remember when jQuery came along, I be telling my the time CTO, no, 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 jQuery's too new, we shouldn't use it. It's so bleeding edge, we gotta use the standard prototype JS. Uh, so JavaScript 5 took a lot of those great concepts that prototype gave us and baked them into the languages like that. And now ECMAScript 6. ECMAScript 6 is actually now officially named ECMAScript 2015. And the reason for this is that CC39, which is a technical subcommittee of the large ECMA International Standards Body, which is the group that, uh, the group that is mandated with continuing to develop the ECMAScript specification, they decided that if you move, if you, instead of using numbers, if you use years, it puts a hell of a lot more pressure on JavaScript engine implementers to actually implement that within that year. So now the move is instead of calling ECMAScript 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, from 6 onwards, it's going to be by year, and every year there will be one new specification. 
So, Equus from 2015 is the current one. Right now, it's hard to switch between them, so the most of the community is just using ES6. You are free to use ES2015 if it's officially correct by the document. Starting next year, Equus from 2016, we will no longer be using the word ES7. I don't think most blockbooks have changed since then, and we'll be just going with Equus from 2016. Whatever gets standardized by the end of that year is fine. If it doesn't make it, it's okay because it's one next year. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Oh, if we don't make it now, we have to wait 10 years, like 23 and 5. So, Equus 2015, as it is right now, that's the new name for this thing. So, as you're Googling, you might find some other thing. So, one of the really nice pieces of Equus for this kit, as well as, in my opinion, sort of software engineering as a whole, is that we don't really have this big concern around plagiarism. We, as an industry, are encouraged, allowed, and are pretty happy to take from the great ideas of other programs. We can consistently take from, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and take the nice and easy constructs, both semantics and syntax from other programming languages, and build them into our own. And JavaScript, as a very obviously popular, such as the Seven Hundred Conference, and a very very fast growing community and specification. Equus Group 6 took the opportunity to do a lot of that. And I'll, I'll go through some of these in detail. But in particular, Equus Group is all about, Equus Group now is often copying from the great features of other languages. We got arrow functions, which is a whole new subset of features in JavaScript, directly from CoffeeScript. So whoever, they don't have CoffeeScript user? Oh, that, that used to be so big. Raise their hand. So, CoffeeScript is now, so, so CoffeeScript gave us arrow functions as an idea. A piece of that is now actually built into JavaScript, we'll talk about Generators, another new feature in ECMAScript, is taken almost directly from Python, pretty much syntax as well. Um, Lisp has the concept of destructuring. Java ECMAScript 6 has a concept called destructuring assignment, which makes, uh, makes it very easy to create new variables without using temporary variables. Uh, C has constant block scope and lots of other ideas that have been permeating with other C-based syntactical languages that have not yet been in JavaScript but are now there. And also, what I found to be a complete surprise here, I've never heard of this program language called E before I started researching this talk, but Equiscript 6 has a concept called temporal strings, which are at face value interpolated strings that allow you to do something like that. But they have a lot more power than Later. And they are a direct copy, almost word for word, from this programming language called E, which is on some computer science site for Carnegie Mellon that I don't know if it ever went anywhere, but has an amazing concept that ECMAScript was able to take, take all of it and put it into this program. So what I'm going to, so I'm going to plan out what I want to talk about today. The first piece of this, so everyone has it different existing systems that they are either in maintenance mode for or in starting to build. And because of that, there are different levels of ease by which you, each of you, can go back to your front of it and actually work with it. I'm breaking this down a little bit by what you can ship in, and I'll explain that a little bit, what you can transpile in, and certain pieces that we just have to wait until browsers actually catch up. Gratefully, by now, that is very, very, very small. So I take it for granted that everyone here knows dearly how to use this particular tag. I was asked a few years ago what my favorite HTML tag was at some panel or something, and I, I gave a script. Now I think it's kind of cliche because it's not a script like that. But I love this script tag. I presume everyone here can use it. And with this lowly single tag, a huge swath of ECMAScript 6 features are available to you. <coughs> Using something called the ES6 shim, this project by Paul Miller, if you go to these slides, ECMAScript is able to, this shim library is able to add a lot of the new features from the ECMAScript standard library that have been added in ES2015 into your system that is, that is running in browsers that can support ES5. So even if you need to support IE8 and 9, almost all of these things are drop in. And I'll go through each of these in some small pieces of this. So how, I don't know about you, so I've written this technically a hundred thousand times. Here I have uh, 
variable has B and check to see if uh, one through negative B is greater than this with your sentinel value negative one. I look at that and I, I, I still have to mentally process why am I checking against negative one? What is this code actually trying to do? And if you find run this, this actually works. If I get my mouse somewhere, there I have. There, the letter B is in the string. Now, gratefully, so what JavaScript, one of the goals of what ECMAScript 6's specification authors had in the back of their head when they were doing this was something called came to pass. So take what people are already doing all the time and make that something simpler and something more straightforward in the new language. So ECMAScript 6 has added something called contains, which again is true. And if I change this to C, it is not. Dot contains is a hell of a lot easier to read and understand than dot index of magic and dot uh, greater than negative one magic. So this will be a common trend as we go through these features. Taking exactly what we all do as developers on a regular basis and converting that to a more standard, straightforward syntax. Everything good? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. So, additionally, as part of this drop in as script tag kind of thing, ECMAScript 6 standardizes promises. So, how many of you have used promises in JavaScript? Okay. So, typically, at least in the current world, unless you're leading edge Chrome, we use a myriad of libraries, many of them crucially. The actual standardization process. Again, with the respective ends and the how that would bring that there were all of these competing libraries, such that the ECMAScript and maybe could say, you're all doing exactly the same thing, let's give you something standard. Now, ECMAScript 6 has in the language support in the standard library for promise. So, whatever promise library you are using, they are all compatible with this, with the exception of both jQuery. I talked about that a little bit afterward. Here, uh, the syntax for this is creating a new promise uh, in the constructor, passing a function with resolve reject. And here is just an example for after one second, that is, that is resolve. So what questions do you have? Questions so far? Uh, the question was, that shim and a polyfill are the same thing, right? Um, if there are differences, I do not know. I think officially a polyfill is for something that is already standardized and a shim might be for something that might be standardized. There's also something called a prolyfill, probably. Uh, there's, <coughs> you can Google for P-R-O-L-L-Y fill. Um, in general, with respect to common developer jargon, yes. <coughs> yes. Yes. Promises A plus. So the question was, which standard of promises is this? The promises A plus specification, uh, which is basically now, with the exception of old jQuery, every single promises library, even before ECMAScript 6 happened, has converged on. That is the specification for ECMAScript 6. So Q, Q would do it. Um, Q, Bluebird, um, whatever other popular node known ones are. Uh, Dollar Q is Angular's version of Q. Yeah. Right? yeah. So yeah. So then we have additionally something that every library in the world has created. And the odd thing is that JavaScript has chosen to call this thing object on a sign, where almost everything else calls it underscore dot extent, or angular dot extent, or jQuery dot extent. Basically, all of the libraries that create functions to map one object's properties into another are now taken by the language so that we don't have to continue to write this very boring code. Here, object.assign takes all of the properties in object2 and assigns them with the same keys and values to object to the object and returns back the merged composition of both of them. Here, if I run them, again, val because the merged has the first one and val2 because merged has the second one. Now, again, not particularly very interesting unless you're a library author, but more reasons why jQuery is smaller. That's why Angular is not small. Why Angular is not small. 
Because all of these libraries can do the exact same thing, and the standard library can do that more performantly, more efficiently, and in the exact same way for everyone. Now here, so I just kind of really missed something here. And now I think I'm sure I've recorded some probably. But I was a Java developer in my life. And as a Java developer, through my enlightenment of JavaScript, I really enjoyed the fact that the standard library had lots and lots of things from the moment like Python had lots of standard libraries. JavaScript's like standard library, by comparison, has been fairly small. In ECMAScript, a lot of the common data structures that are expected to be in you know, modern web programming languages have been added to JavaScript. For example, sets, which are uh, unordered groups of elements with no duplicates. <clears throat> so here, it's a very it's an easy way, for example, to unique a large list or something like that. Creating a set, here I'm adding uh, three, four items, but the second one, the last P is a duplicate. Here you'll see that the size is actually only three, and alerting them give A, B, and C, and no, not two Bs. Again, standard set semantics of other programming languages, JavaScript now has it. Uh, similarly, maps. Maps are very similar to objects. Objects are, objects in JavaScript, the type, are key value pairs mapping from strings to a But it's just string. What maps allow us to do is create objects that have keys that are any kind of thing. The keys don't have to be strings. Right now, if you put in keys as an object, their JavaScript will call it to string on that, and you cannot have two different items with the same object key in JavaScript currently. But with ex6, ES6 and with the addition of maps, we are able to do things like, so for example, here, between the, the object object and the map map, both of them have this value. But if I set a key here as an object, now here you can actually put the whole object in there. But if I create a new one that's exactly the same, and I check if object two is there, this will be false because it actually checks by reference that it's exactly the same object. Whereas, if I try to do this, It will say true for object and test and object two. Even though these are completely different things, object and object two are two completely different objects, two completely different locations in memory. Because objects only use strings, it gets very confusing. Using maps, we are able to specifically point to one object as a key in a map. Yes. Um, I don't know. I know that you can do that for objects. So the question was, can you set property, configurable property on maps? Uh, I know that you can do that in objects, and I would presume that if you wanted to overwrite configurability or configurability, you need that object. I do not know if map maps have this similar. I presume no. Okay. <clears throat> and then lastly, rounding up this, so, uh, these shimables. Um, further along paving the cow pads, JavaScript has added things like object.is, which prevents triple, e you don't have to necessarily triple equal everything because sometimes that doesn't work. For example, if you're actually trying to check if man triple equals man. Have you ever tried to do that? No? Okay, so it does. Anyone want to guess? False. They're not the same thing. So JavaScript added this new thing called object.is. 
Now here, it actually works, because there are lots of hacks behind the scenes and triple people checking about the find that can you can actually verify this. Object.is is basically triple equals, except it actually works without surprise across every possible kind of value and kind of type in JavaScript. Also, just like how ECMAScript 5 added back, filter, reduce, reduce, right, all of these extra things, arrays now have a few other functions as well, like array.from. So you can take a uh, you can take a DOM element list that's almost like an array in case you've ever queried for these things and convert them very easily into an array. You can also call find on, on arrays, which um, will search the array for some value that passes a predicate. This is, by the way, uh, and I'll talk about this a little later, an arrow function, a very short hand syntax that ECMAScript 6 has for functions. And uh, here, I'll show you. We can get the return the value three because it found the at the, in, the second index that there is a value like that. Uh, similarly, there is a new function called find index, which is similar to index of, except it actually makes a little bit more sense in English, where you can find that the object that passes this predicate is at index two, zero, one, two. So I have some examples here in case you want to. So there are. The shield section is many more items than JavaScript. There are on the order of two dozen or so standard library features that can be added to your project in 30 seconds. Anyone, so no matter what system you're using, WordPress, Google, uh, MVSD, uh, Classic ESD, or, or something like Angular or whatever, or something like that, you can add in this script tag, I'm like, sure, in less than five minutes. There's a lot more here to delve into and go into this one. Slide away 20 minutes. Oh, there are lots of examples online. These particular links are to something called TDD bin, where you can go through and test yourself and in a TDD style see errors, be able to pass these tests, make them clean, each of different pieces of ECMAScript 6. You're free to go through these things at your own time. There's a lot more here that you can add very, very quickly to your own project. So now I'm going to start talking about the transpilers. This is where these features go from new globals that you can use and new functions that are added to the first mix of arrays into new pieces of syntax. New pieces of syntax that are often sugar for existing ones. But they make life a lot easier because we don't have to necessarily type as much as we used to do. So we actually implement these things. There are a few different transpilers. How many of you use a transpiler? Okay. So what a transpiler is. The transpiler will take code from one programming language and convert it to the code of another programming language. Very similar to a compiler, there are lots of arguments that we can get to around the transpiler and the apps and things to worry about. Uh, and so there were a few different options, but right now, Babel by far has won the mind share and support of a large swath of open source projects as well as actual compilers. So Babel is a tool that will you are able to write ECMAScript specific syntax, and it will write, it will rewrite that into the equivalent ECMAScript file that can actually run in the browser today. And what is the distinction from the other options like doing transform, which recently just got uh, deprecated by Facebook, and Treasure, which is a Google project as well, is that that was focused on producing output that is still human readable. So in case you do need to debug something. In case you don't want to be digging through your source maps, you can actually go read the ECMAScript 5 that is spit out at the end. Because it preserves variable names, it preserves annotations, it preserves comments, all of these other things. So Babel is, is the, the core tool that we'll be using to do some of these things. <clears throat> and what that allows for is new syntax like the block scope variable. So I don't know how many of you, so let me just walk through this code. I have an array, I have another array called no, a process. I for loop through that array. I create new functions and push them onto the output array, but alerting some value. And then I call those functions. And that's what I do on line 10 down here. I don't know how many of you have seen something like this before. This is a very common interview question that I gratefully have not given, but I have heard too many many times. Can anyone tell me what is alert on line 10? 
Don't worry, I just hit the run button. Back to that very quickly. So, my expectation from writing this code is that it tells me one, two, and three. But what do I actually get? I get three. Three. And three. And the reason for this is something that is not actually that complicated, but it's immensely tricky to see what is actually happening. And the reason for this is because when these functions are called down here, which is actually written out the sources here, it is alerting the value of the variable map. But inside this entire code, there is only one variable now. There are not three different ones. So if the alerting happens afterwards, it can only alert one number. The variable can only have multiple values at the same time. So by the time this last line is called, the variable val is set to the value of three. And that's why we are alerted three times. This is something that, let alone the interview question of someone who's trying to trick this completely breaks the like laws of least surprise around solid software development. Because I look at this code, it looks like it should be doing something, but it actually does something very, very different. What ECMAScript 6 allows you to do with respect to a new keyword is create something called a block scoped variable by using the keyword let. So let is very similar to var. So how many of you went to Kyle's talk yesterday? Okay, so you know more about this probably than I can explain right now. But let is similar to var, but instead of having variables that are scoped to the function definition, which in this particular piece of code is the entire piece of code, they are block scoped. So if you are used to C or C++ or Java, the block is basically the closest curve. So in this case, now when I, when I call this with let and I run, I get what I'm expecting to get, one, two, three. And the reason for this is every time this for loop iterates, there is a new location in memory created for this variable by this let keyword that is scoped to these particular curly braces. Now, this, is, this will make things, if, with respect to writing new code, using let allows you to do things like uh, not worry about using if. Now, you don't have to add the, the, the wrapper around the file because all you need is two curlies. Everything is on the left side because those two curlies will make sure nothing can be called the scope if you're only using lets. Um, basically, this, this allows us to be more easily reasoning about the scope of variables it's because it's typically more obvious if we are thinking about the span of a curly brace instead of the span of a function as we're trying to debug. As you can see from this. Uh, on the, so additionally, there's another new block scope variable called const, or the keyword called const. This keyword allows you to create immutable bindings. So here you'll see if I write this, if I set const x equals one, and I try to overwrite that with two, um, I actually get an error. This is a runtime error that I've caught and alerted, saying that something very surprising is happening in that hallway. Uh, I will get an error saying that it is read-only, and this is something taken care of by the JavaScript environment that you're using. Um, well, so, so what, what questions do you have? Like, uh, where are they at? Um, so in general, if you want to be supporting Lower browsers, most browsers, you need to be using Babel to transpile. What I'm actually doing here is transpiling in the background every time I hit one with Babel and then invalid that. So some of these features are, I believe, let, let is definitely in Chrome. I do not remember the concept of Chrome. Uh, newest Chrome, V8, actually. Uh, the, the question was, if you transpile, do you not need to use the shim? So, depending on your transpiler, the answer is yes or no. Some, um, if, you, if you are already transpiling and you are using pieces, like object.is or something like that, the transpilers can inject those in for you if you need them to. Uh, I find it easier, though, to add the shim everywhere anyway, and then remove, because then I use them frequently enough that I don't care about the optimization of saying that this file doesn't get object is, but this does, but it did depend on the Yes?
So the question was, practically speaking, is there any reason to use this bar? Um, so this is, of course, the cost of the project on our very left. With respect to new projects, they're starting something from scratch. Don't go like, by replacing everything from bar to They're starting a new project. It depends on if you are using hoisting for some, like, semantic reason. For example, this, so I typically, my, my style of development is that I write a lot of function declarations really far below the top of the file, and then use them throughout the top. That's something that you could never do with Latin, because Latin is only, Latin will never be what bars are. So, I don't think you can say generically that, there, that you should never use bar again, but I think typically let is now going to be the standard and bar is going to be the exception. So I'm going to run through, through these things a little bit more quickly, but feel free, we can talk afterward for a long time about these. Um, so, so next is arrow function. So I showed a little bit of this earlier, and basically you are able to write really small syntax, terse syntax for function now, instead of having to type F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N, which I, myself, have never quite been annoyed about, but some people are extremely annoyed about having to type that. Um, we are able to write using the syntax uh, parentheses around parameters, uh, arrow functions of equal sign greater than, uh, and then if there is a single return value, you do not need to have anything else in terms of syntax, this will take a variable and then double it, <laughs> add it to 20. Uh, and then if you do need to do multiple lines, you can put this around it. And now again, the last, oh, that once you do have the curlies, you need to have return statements. So now we have a very shorthanded way of creating functions. Uh, additionally, one special thing about this function that I'm not going to get too far into right now is the this value of the function is, is frozen and it cannot be, you call and apply cannot be used on it to change this value. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then destructuring. So I talked about this, this feature of the list that I don't know if anyone has ever used before. Uh, yes. Arrow functions have implicit returns. The question was, do arrow functions have implicit returns? They do have implicit returns if they are only one line. <coughs> so if they're only one state. So if there are multiple, if there are semicolons, if there's more than one semicolon, then it does not have implicit returns. Okay. So destructuring this weird this list thing that in case anyone's ever actually played with list, it's odd to do because no one actually calls this thing a feature of list. Try to tell exactly what it is. Basically, it's a way for us to actively create variables in the place that they are called. It's called destructuring assignment. So what this means is here, I have an example of calling a function with an array, and this is what destructuring allows us to do. Instead of having to, what you typically would do in a, in a situation like this, you create an argument, and then you would write var fst equals r1 or 0. You have to individually break all of these things down, and that's actually what most of my, many functions, especially as options parameters got very popular in JavaScript. Basically, the top few lines of my, all of my functions are just plucking things out of the arguments that I want to use and give them correct names, and then actually do my functions a little bit. What destructuring assignment allows you to do is do all of that name plucking directly in the argument store. Because since JavaScript knows that you're passing an array here, it will allow you to give these things names directly in C2. And that, that, that concept is called destructuring. This works on arrays as well as objects. Here, again, I can destructure not only arrays by index, but also functions by, but also objects by the names of their keys. 
I can also have, for example, a, a different name here. It does support squares. Okay, I'll worry about this. <laughs> So the question was, does it support splats? I think I have that on the next slide. I will show you. Okay. So in addition to destructure, destructure has the destructure is by itself a fairly large scope feature. You can do lots of things. You can destructure in arguments of a function, as I described here. You can also just destructure in variables. So now you can you can flip items in arrays without using temporary variables. Destructuring is now permeating the language of syntax in many ways. You can also call something like, you can also use the dot 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 syntax, which is called rest parameters, in order to create a real array. So I don't know, how many of you use arguments in JavaScript? The arguments object? Okay. So in JavaScript, free entry, there is this thing called arguments. The arguments object, it actually is here. So it is an object, it is an object argument. It is something that is called an array like. It is an object that has integer string indexes. It has a dot length property. But it's not really an array. You cannot call arguments dot square. You cannot call arguments dot filter. It doesn't have all the different array methods. It's just sort of like an array. What uh, this dot 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 syntax allows you to do is this will create a real array. So you don't have to go through all of the typical boilers that need to convert arguments into an array. You've seen, if you look, for example, at the source code about this code, basically every single function in the beginning takes whatever, whatever it uh, passes the parameter and then converts that into a real array. <coughs> this allows us to get real arrays from the beginning. So here I create a function that, call, that has rest parameters that passes an array called args. Then here I use another version of destructure where instead of in the parameter list of a function as I did earlier, it passes them in the uh, names of variable declarations, pulls out the two different arguments here and alerts each of them. Here I call them, I called this with two different, um, I call these with two parameters. One is O, one is just an empty function that um, that gives me true and function because this destructuring pulls out the different values of the arc arc array. Yes. So the question was how much can you nest destruction? So destruction can go as deeply as you want it to. So you can destructure multiple objects nestedly or arrays in object and object. The difference between the top level and the lower level is structure. So if you try to structure at the top level a variable or an object or a variable that doesn't exist, it will talk to you. So if you uh, let me show let's say I did if I do that, no error. Right? No, nothing happens and nothing goes wrong. But if you destructure deeply, anything that does not match deeply will throw an error. So you will need to wrap that and try to hack. So you can you can nest as deeply as you want to with destructuring. You just have to know that if you go deeply, it will throw. If you keep at the top level, it will not throw. Okay, so I think I'm going to I'm going to run through this again more quickly. We now have template strings. I don't know, I've been made fun of a lot by the non-JavaScript developers in my social group that JavaScript has no way except pluses and pluses and strings and the more pluses in order to concatenate strings. Now, using backticks, you can um, not only create a string that is interpolated. So here, the variables inside this dollar dollar curly thing are interpolated. You can also do something that is unheard of before in JavaScript, creating new lines. Whoa. I thought that was unbelievably exciting for how many times I've typed plus slash n. Um, <coughs> sorry. 
So then we have the, the, the JavaScript 6 also has generators. Generators is a, another extremely large topic. Uh, it allows us to create something, create functions that are essentially plausible in time, allowing you to re-enter execution at the midpoint of a function. Uh, here is an example that I'd love to talk to you more about uh, afterward that creates an infinite loop. This is not something that you could typically do in JavaScript because Chrome or Node would just kill your processors at some point. Whereas using this and using this new for of syntax to walk through iterators uh, created by generators, you can, or not, we'll get back to that later. You can actually walk through and every time you get a yield statement in the generator, the function invocation pauses and returns control to the caller. Um, and another potential controversial one, ECMAScript 6 now has classes, regular class syntax that matches very similarly to CoffeeScript, um, what people are used to when they come from other languages. Uh, gratefully for me, I work on a team that has a lot of very, very strong Java developers, as well as some people who converted similarly to myself from Java over to JavaScript many, many years ago. <clears throat> this is something that allows the familiarity of uh, object-oriented concepts and the use of super and this more fluidly allows that to engage with people much more straightforwardly because everyone knows what classes are standard from the uh, classical way and Birth level inheritance, although very interesting and very fun, is not typically something they teach you in school. So this uh, standard-wise does what you expect it to do. It has a constructor, it has a particular instance method, and you can create it. <clears throat> okay, so I have a whole list of things for you here to try out. I do want to touch a little bit on modules that I have that So modules are one of the it's hard for every time I think about this, they're all great features, but modules are one of those foundational features that gives JavaScript something that every single other programming language that anyone born than someone with PhD thesis has used at a standard level of comparison. So now we have the ability, and I have a <coughs> examples in the repository for this in case you are working online, for how the module system works. ECMAScript 6 is module system immensely flexible. It takes into account all of the needs for both the build and the client side, with significant inspiration from AMD requires it as well as browser. And for front end people, it can load, it can load, it can load your dependencies very, very quickly. Uh, and I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. I'm actually very, very interested in it. It is just the more, it is a fairly lofty goal to fit all of that in. Um, so lastly, there is a group of things. Is anyone a Rubik's Cube person? Like I was when I was a kid. I am no longer now. But I could never solve it. And there is a group of things that are intractable. So you can go back very easily add your mystic uh, shim and actually get a lot of these features. You can add a transpiler and get a lot of these features. But there are some things that are basically unsolvable. There are some approximations. But they're very difficult to do without the browser support. Uh, the first one is weak maps. Weak maps are a type of map that, uh, that optimize memory very well based on what is at what has fallen out of scope and what has not. This is something that is predominantly used by library authors and not necessarily by people land, but it is an immense memory performance optimization that will uh, that will make jQuery, for example, much much faster and easier to write. But it's not yet. If it's not something that you can transpile. Okay? We need to understand the intricacies of the memory management of the system. It is specified. I believe that CDH has support for find a flag, but it's something that you can't do on your own without the browser or your job to do. Proxies are a new way for uh, objects to respond very fluidly to property lookups, more than just getters and setters. It's getters and setters not applied. Uh, that's also something that needs to, it cannot be transpiled and needs to be done by the uh, meta program and it's also done by the JavaScript execution environment. And lastly, this is one of the, especially the functional programmers, functional programmers, or functional program designers who will tail call installation. So officially JavaScript did not have tail call installation until VS6. It is something that can be approximated by Babel in very straightforward cases. 
very obvious to write your code in a way that's very obvious to the other side. But the actual specification allows for all of the optimizers, regardless of how you write the optimize, and the browser renders will be in the and the creators will be will be doing that. So I have only touched on a small, tiny bit of the iceberg here. There are hundreds of features, by the way. Hard to, hard, hard to go through all of them. There, there are well, there are on the order of 120, I think. So I said that wrong before. I encourage you. So if you click here, this is a link of all of the features of ECMAScript. Um, given by their name and the specification, and all of the, the matrix of support in these different browsers, support in different environments, like Babel, Arrow, Fisher, all of these other things. So what I want you to do right now, as you leave here, I want you to add VS Fiction. Because as I said earlier, I know this is easy for you. I know you, because you, I know you've written a script tag sometime in the past six months, and I know you can do this. Make things a lot easier and a lot more straightforward. You can read, so Axel Ruschmeyer has an amazing blog called Tuality. He is on TC39 and does a lot of great uh, community work around writing about ECMAScript 6. Aria Hedayat, similar situation. Adi Osmani, uh, dev evangelist for Chrome uh, by Google. Um, add a branch, so you can easily branch something, start adding an ECMAScript transpiler. What I did actually on my original project for this a couple, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, was the behind people's backs add an IBS6 transpiler, eventually merge that transpiler because it's all backwards compatible. So everything I've talked about is backwards compatible. So you can do all of this without ever using a single feature and no one will ever know. So you add this branch, merge that in, no one will have to write anything fancy until you actually start to you know, advocate for this stuff inside your company. Transpile and shim all of this. It's going to be amazing. You have to have one meme in every talk, but, but here it is. I hope to hear all of your exciting stories about bringing ECMAScript 6 to everyone very, very soon. Feel free to reach out to me, email me, tweet, tweet me anyway, because my, my company is gratefully doing a lot of this stuff, and I'd love to get other people being able to do uh, all of these things as well. So just to wrap up, so I'm John Paul. I, uh, I love JavaScript. I have for a long time. I've loved that I've been able to make uh, things that my parents can actually see and understand in the browser rather than a lot of back JavaScript. I do have my DAO instances with Scala and Clojure and all sorts of things every once in a while. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me with questions or otherwise. I'd love to hear, hear more from you. Uh, also, I work at a company called InRhythm, which is a JavaScript consultancy in New York. We are always hiring. Of course, it's a little farther away, although in certain situations we do offer relocation. In case you are interested in working with me on my team, working on all of these great technologies. We are doing React Angular, ES6, lots of other things. Please get in touch. I'd love to talk to you. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So I, I don't quite know if I have questions time, but feel free, we can talk, anyway. Now, of course, back to the um, so the shim, so it depends on what you're using from the shim. So you can actually use ES5 shim and ES6 shim on top of the back. So if you use both, uh, if you use both, you can go back to IE7. With the exception of getting accepted, go back to IE7. 